Please be seated. And the rain would stop just as we are coming into the chapel. Would be no. Hey, welcome family and friends and distinguished guests. Uh, warm greetings on behalf of the entire staff and faculty of the College of Information and Communications. My name is Tom Reichert, I'm Dean of the College, and I personally welcome you to the December 2019 pudding ceremony for the School of Library and Information Science. Students, we welcome you as well. Uh, we have master's students, doctoral students, and today it's all about you. The School of Library and Information Science is a top tier program nationally ranked for excellence and affordability. The faculty in the school are among the very best and brightest, and the staff team is here to see you succeed. I see that spirit firsthand every day. This program is built to challenge you, but the people in this program possess a heartfelt desire to see you succeed, and you have. So graduates, would you please stand? I'd like you to do a 180 turn around to your family and loved ones and thank them for the support they've given you in this journey. So hooding is one of the school's most honored and anticipated traditions. Graduates, when we hood you today, you will officially become librarians and information specialists. From here, you'll go forth into schools, public libraries, universities, government, and business. Some of you may even decide to come back for more education. But while your careers will vary, the goal that drives each of you will be the same, to connect people with the information they need to succeed. Connecting people with information is woven into your fabric. It's the crux of your profession. You have what it takes to make a difference, and your degree certifies that. So in closing, let me just say that our job is done. Yours continues. You have our trust. You've earned our confidence. And we can't wait to see uh, how much brighter our future and uh, how much you will improve the world for all of us. So now let me, excuse me, let me introduce the school's director, Dr. David Blankens. Good morning. Welcome to the last hooding ceremony of the decade. And it has been an interesting decade to say the least like three of them shoved into one. So I will not take up too much of your time, but there's just enough time for one last little lecture. As I was preparing my remarks, I found myself thinking about global issues, divided politics, monetizing pri privacy, the growing specter of artificial intelligence developed outside of issues of social responsibility, growing economic disparity, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. <laughs> little Ghostbusters humor for you. <laughs> And I started to write the sort of formulaic doom and gloom speech and that always ends with, and now go out and fix it. But I figured, this is not a time for doom and gloom. I learned in a very personal way this semester that this is not how I need to send you out to the world. You're well aware of the challenges before you. But our communities don't need you to save them. They need you to inspire them. Our students in the poorest and richest school need an ally to accept them as they are, lift what burdens they can, and let them know that they are worthy and important. Our neighbors need a partner and a friend to learn and dream with them. The doctors, lawyers, engineers, professors, and public servants need an expert that not only serves, but makes them better. Our elected officials need role models in integrity and trustworthiness. Just as you don't need to be reminded that the world can seem overwhelming, neither do your communities. They need a light to shine a way forward, not to spotlight challenges. So here's my final lesson for you. Fight injustice, fight inequity, fight apathy, 
but do not be consumed in that fight. No one is served by a librarian lost in despair. In a recent interview, Paul Bloom, a Yale psychology professor, made a distinction between empathy and compassion. Empathy, he pointed out, is taking on others' emotions as our own. To be empathetic is to feel the pain of others. Empathy can be exhausting and depleting. It can be debilitating. Imagine, he pointed out, the oncologist that has to constantly feel the fear of her patients or the social worker lost in feelings of hopelessness of his clients. Bloom argues that doctors and the social workers need to be compassionate, not empathetic. You need to be compassionate and understand the struggles of those we serve, but not be debilitated by it. Preserve your optimism and use it to lift those around you. Your professional responsibility is not to suffer but to prevent suffering. Your professional responsibility is not to despair, but to bring hope to the despondent. Seek out those in need and remember what they need is assistance and support and celebration in addition to service and dedication. Every great librarian has a story. Some of these stories are big and amazing. Some of these stories are about big projects they pulled out or different people they helped. They have a story. A lot of them are very intimate in their connections. It can be a glowing child who spends a half an hour at the desk telling them how wonderful the book is that you helped them link up to. It can be an academic librarian who tells about the student they helped pass, or a scholar they helped discover something new. It can be a array of things, but it's something that we hold on to. It's a reminder of why we do this. You need to find that story. You need to take that story with you. So whether you're changing the toner cartridge for the 13th time or saying, no, I do not know where that USB disk is, or God forbid, hearing about the bathroom issue, <laughs> or dealing with another meeting or another discussion or yet another person going, oh, a librarian, do we still need this? That's the time you bring out your story. That's the time you bring it out and say, yes, we do. Yes, we need librarians. Yes, we need academics. Yes, we need people that are dedicated to making the world a better place. Compassionate professionals who seek out the best in our communities and not the worst. That bring together a social discourse, that weave together communities of doctors and academics, 12th graders, third graders. That's what we need. So my last instruction. My last assignment for you that I get to make is find your story. And then I have the great honor of introducing someone with a pretty spectacular story herself. Tamara King, excuse me, is the, this is a long introduction. And I was saying, oh, what could we clip? And the answer is none of it, because it's brilliant and wonderful, and I'm going to read it. She's the Community Relations Director for the Richland Library. In her role, she is tasked with developing, directing, and implementing communication strategies to key st stakeholders and audiences of the Richland Library. Tamara also supervises the Office of Development, which supports the Richland Library friends and foundations, along with the Library Volunteer Program. She has nearly two decades of experience in broadcast television, public relations, marketing, strategic communications, media, and crisis communications, training, and program management. In, her addition, in addition to her role leading the library's community relations efforts, Tamara also chairs the library's amazing, award-winning social awareness task force. Through Tamara's leadership, the task force has held discussions surrounding race, women's rights, and social justice for more than 1,000 participants. Tamara is nationally and locally recognized as an award-winning public relations professional and was recently recognized as a 2019 library journal mover and shaker in her role library rich and libraries race equity and social awareness work she has won communications awards from the international association of business communications of south carolina and the south carolina public relations society tamar also won a national bronze telly award and is host and producer of the nationally recognized public affairs show richland revealed tamar has a degree in journalism and mass communications and a master's degree in library and information science from the university of south carolina it is great honor and with great pride that I introduce one of the best of our alumni that you will soon be joining.
Tamara Kim. I'm a little shorter than Mr. Lankus, Dr. Lankus. How are you guys today? Are y'all ready? Do you feel motivated? You're ready to start this chapter. Um, as I was sitting thinking, what do I say to graduating folks when I was just in your seat literally five years ago, almost to the day, and I was thinking, what do I say? What will help uh, impart you for What can I impart to you for the journey ahead? And as luck would have it, I was watching reality TV. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell the librarians, especially the children librarians, right? Um, I was watching TV, and there was a reality show. And this famous actress, they asked her, why did you take part in this reality show? And she said, well, my son said I should do it. And I said, oh, I'm too scared to do it. And her son said, well, then do it scared. And I thought about that, and I said, ah, oh, that's it. Because there are going to be times where you're going to have to do it scared. And there have been times in my life where I've had to do it scared. And I want to tell you about those three times today, if you would bear with me. Um, one of those times, and I want to stress that if you do it scared, one thing will happen. I can't promise success. I can't promise that it will go well. But I can promise you that you'll learn. And so I want to tell you about the times that I did it scared and I learned something. The first time, I was 14 years old, and I'd never heard of the Governor's School of Creative Arts, but they came to my little high school in Manning, South Carolina. Anybody know where Manning is? It's tiny, right? And the Governor's School came, and they said, we're having a two-week program for ninth graders and rising 10th graders, and would you like to come and audition, and here's all the great things. And I'd never had acting lessons. I'd never uh, done anything like that, but I came home with this audacity to tell my mother I wanted to audition for the Governor's School of South Carolina. After she said, what, what? She said, okay, we'll do it. That was not the scared part, because I wasn't scared. When I auditioned, as luck would have it, I made it. The scary part was when I got there, I was the only African-American girl in the entire program. Out of 120 kids out of the entire state of South Carolina, I was the only African-American girl. I was thrown way out of my comfort zone. I was telling myself, oh, I'm not ready. I can't do this. There's no way. I'm a little girl from, four, you know, I'm 14 years old. I'm from Manning, South Carolina, and Hollywood, Young's Island. There's no way that I would fit in with these people who had been taking acting lessons for quite a while, right? But I didn't call my mom. I decided to stick it out. And I learned that no matter if you are by yourself, even if you're the only one, you can do it if you always bring yourself to the table. And it has served me well when I'm the only African-American in the room, when I'm the only woman in the room, I may be the only one of a socioeconomic class. It doesn't matter because I'm always who I am. So that was my most important lesson in that space. The second lesson I learned, and I did it scared, uh, this is a little unorthodox, so bear with me. I have an announcement and a confession. I am terrified of porta potties like 100% terrified. Like I always think I'm going to get tipped in them. And it's a phobia. It's a real honest to God, panic attack causing phobia. And I had lived 34 years without getting into one. Yes, it was quite a feat I was proud of. And I go to help my husband at this festival. He says, okay, come help me. I've got to man this table. I'm a good wife, I'm gonna go. About two hours in, of a four-hour shift, you know, comes a time where girls got to go. And I ask him, so where are the bathrooms? Uh, he's like, over there, that, those porta potties Right? So I'm freaking out. No way. No way am I going to get in it. I'm having a full-scale, like, meltdown. What am I going to do? We can't leave. And a woman leans over to me, and she said, there are three rules to a porta potty First rule, don't go into it expecting it to be more than it is. It's a porta potty <laughs> Number two, don't look around. And number three, get in and get out. Don't stop. Just do what you got to do and get out of there. So I get a dose of bravery, and I'm like, I'm going to do this. No one's going to tip me today, right? I'm going to get in this porta potty. So I get in it. I'm doing it scared, and I break all the rules, right? Like, I expected it to flush. Big mistake. If you've never been to a porta potty, they do not flush. I thought it was like an airplane bathroom. So that was mistake number one. Number two was probably the biggest mistake. I looked around. 
yeah, it was, it was very traumatic. So because I looked around, I started having a panic attack. I was like, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. But I had to, I really, really had to. So I did it. And I didn't do what I had to do and get out of there. I spent 20 minutes in there freaking out about this experience and just knowing uh, the minute that I started anything, I was gonna get tipped over. And then I would be the person I was before I got tipped and then the person I am after I got tipped. Like I would be in counseling and, and I was terrified of this thing. And I walked out, I was all flustered, my hair's a mess, I was stressed in there. And she said, what happened? How was it? I said, it was terrible. It was the worst experience. And she said, you broke all the rules, didn't you? <laughs> and I had to admit, I had broken all the rules. I had expected it to be more than it was. I had looked around and paid attention to things that I shouldn't have paid attention to. And I was in there way longer than I needed to be. And that has served me well when I've had to do it scared. There are going to be times when things will be unpleasant. There will be times when there are knees shaking, voice quaking. I can't do this thing because you know it's going to be horrible. But at the end of the day, if you follow those rules, right, you expect it to be what it is, it's going to suck, right? Like you just know. It's not going to be pleasant. And number two, you'll say, yeah. I'm gonna just go in, I'm not gonna look around, I'm not gonna worry about what other people are doing. And then you will get in and out as quickly as you can. So that was the lesson from that. And the third and most important lesson happened when, about seven years ago, I was sitting at a kitchen table with my best friend and her husband, and we're having this late night kind of kitchen conversation that you often have. And at that point in my career, I had done a lot of PR, uh, public relations, I had done journalism and mass comm, I'd done radio, I'd done television, but I didn't know what was next for me. And my best friend asked me a question that I encourage each of you graduates to do and everybody in the audience to at least once in your life ask this question. She said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? What job would you take if it didn't matter to your career? What path would you do? What would you decide to do? I took a minute, took a breath, breathed in and I said, let me give breath and air to this vision, this dream. And I'm sure they're expecting me to say, I don't know, be the next Oprah Winfrey or uh, as I wanted to be when I was a young kid, uh, like the first black Connie Chung, if that's a thing, <laughs> if anyone knows who Connie Chung is. Um, and they're expecting me to say something like that. And I said, I want to go to library school, right? And so <laughs> my friend, you could hear crickets, her and her husband looked at me like I'd grown another head. And she said, well, that seems realistic, do it. And I did it, and I did it scared. And I will tell you that that has been the best decision, the best moment that I've ever made that choice to do it scared has been going to library school and learning and joining the library and information science field. It has been amazing. I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot. I've never laughed more, never had more fun, never brought more of myself to work than I have as a librarian at Richland Library. And when I met Nellie Huggins for the first time, I fangirled her like really hard. And I'm so embarrassed to say when I met her, I was like, I love you, I love you, I love you. And she probably thought I was whack, like this wackadoodle. <laughs> but I, working for her and she gives me the space to think up crazy things. And she gives me permission to do it scared every single day. And I encourage each of you to find a space and a place that allows you to work magic, that allows you to do it scared, and to allows you to do it scared without fear that if you do it scared, everything will fall around your ears. Because every time you do it scared, you learn something. I am so thankful to stand before you today as someone who did it scared and has really benefited from this program and from this field. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, David Lankis, for inviting me. And thank you to the School of Library and Information Science for encouraging me to do it scared. Thank you guys so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. We're going to get started with recognizing and hooding our graduates. Um, first, we are going to recognize we have one PhD student graduate, graduating today. Um, and so we would first like to call to the stage 
Dr. Ezra Abdo. I'd like to invite Valerie Birdfort up. She will read the names of our MLIS candidates. Are you ready? Yay! All right. Michelle Stevens Allen. Leanna Bain. <laughs> Sylvestra Caroline Bradley. Anne Clifton Katz. <laughs> Elizabeth Doyle. Jonna Evans. Shonda Gaither. <laughs> Kendall Hallberg.
Aaron Howard. Long. Mary Ann Moton. Jean Peliquin. Amanda Bracken Reed, <laughs> Laura Stillwagon. Nell Thompson. And Laura Castradale War. Before I introduce our student speaker, I would like to invite our new faculty colleague, our new doctoral colleague to the stage. Um, Ezra, we have a seat saved for you up here. To give the closing remarks, it is tradition to invite uh, a representative from the graduating class, uh, a representative that truly embodies uh, what we seek, uh, compassionate professionals that are out to change the world. So with that, I would like to introduce Amanda Bracken-Reed to give the closing remarks. Lankus. Good morning, fellow graduates, family, faculty, and friends. I've thought weeks about what I would say in this moment as we come to a close during our time at the University of South Carolina and begin our professional career in libraries. I could find no words, so I thought an interpretive dance would be best. <laughs> However, not in this outfit. Best I could do for you was I'm a little teapot, but that'll come later. 
As we leave campus today, official librarians and doctors, how good does that feel? Whew, we did it. We are continuing on this journey most of us have been on for years. Many of us have worked in school media centers, public or academic libraries, or even museums for the better part of our careers. While I understand this isn't the case for many of us as the library world attracts all types of backgrounds, we are expanding on our library careers from the tools and knowledge we've gained in this program. I am very fortunate to have both of my grandparents here today. Hi, Nana and Papa. When I started working in public libraries 12 years ago, I remember my Papa saying that smart people surround themselves with people who are different and more experienced than they are, so they can learn and grow from their example. And that's exactly what the library has done for me. I believe what he exactly said was, smart people surround themselves with smarter people, and you're no dummy. But I interpreted what he said. One of the most important takeaways this program has provided us is a built-in networking and support system of people with those different backgrounds and experiences. I urge you to keep connected with your colleagues, join professional associations, add each other on social media. The people sitting right next to you today are the ones you're going to be working with throughout the rest of your careers, whether you're in South Carolina or not. The library world is very small. <laughs> Take care of yourselves and each other. I can honestly say that I would not have made it through this program without the incredible support system I have of my colleagues. Life did not stop while we completed this program, even though a pause button would have been nice just for a little bit, right? At times, a pause button would have been nice. I said that. <laughs> I, know the, I know the hardships many of you face during this program, and I commend you for completing this program and sitting where you are now. Congratulations. I'd like to thank the faculty for the opportunity to deliver closing remarks to our graduating class. I've had the privilege to learn from professors such as Dr. Kaluuya and Dr. Lewis since 2013 as an undergraduate in the Information Science Program, and I can't thank them enough for their guidance and support throughout the years. Finally, I send my most sincere congratulations to the graduating class of 2019 from the Master's in Library and Information Science Program. We did the damn thing. <laughs> and your hard work has paid off. I look forward to continuing learning and growing with you in our profession. Thank you so much. All right, that concludes our um, hooding ceremony. Before we all go, um, please rise for the singing of the University of South Carolina alma mater.